I'm very aware that uh, you haven't yet seen the exhibition, and we're talking without images. <laughs> so we'll, we'll do our best to actually prepare you for what you're going to see, which is fantastic. I've had the privilege of walking around it already, and having to have seen the new film whose premiere is tonight, Fordlandia. So, uh, I, I, but I'm, I'm going to s start with a question about uh, the relationship for you between painting and film. Because when I, when I first met you in Mexico City, mm -hmm. you were painting the wonderful abstract, very, very abstract, very linear oil paintings. Mm -hmm. Well, acrylic actually, were they? Oil. <laughs> Acrylic enamel. Acrylic enamel, yes. Um, and at the same time as making films and installations and objects, and you've gone on making paintings, and every now and again you've said, well, painting is still at the basis of things. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could just say something about that, because there's some wonderful paintings, new paintings, in the exhibition as well as the films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think... Um, in a sense that um, I, I suppose that I'm looking for similar things in painting as, as I am in, in film, uh, but, but in quite different and also in quite similar ways. <laughs> um, so I think, um, I think it's particularly clear in the, in the new film where abstraction and film and painting are, are somehow parallel. Um, and then I think that um, also the uh, uh, there's a some kind of um, uh, sort of indistinct and turbulent space which I'm trying to look for in paintings, um, which I think comes over in a very different way in in the film works where I'm I'm not looking for necessarily um, linear narratives or. <coughs> not looking necessarily for a beginning and an end. And, and somehow some kind of suspended space in painting, which I'm also looking for in the, in the film works as well. Um, and, and it's always um, a, a parallel practice. And I think I'm kind of always, I always feel a bit um, frustrated in a sense that I'm, I, I, I'm a bit too... Um, maybe sort of um, hyperactive or, or agitated to be a, a, just a painter. And sometimes I really admire and really respect those people that, that can sit there and look at the white wall, <laughs> you know, for eight hours a day and, and, and paint. But somehow for me, that sort of solitariness or loneliness of the painting uh, or a painter's um, space. I need that to be accompanied by, you know, this sort of out in the world mm. practice. Mm. So I think, you know, that, that 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 I'm always very happy to get back to the studio, but I'm also happy to get out of it. So I think that, that the these these two the sort of flat world of painting momentarily goes into the the three dimensional world and then comes back into the flatness of the film somehow. Mm. Because they do seem to be running parallel rather than mm. one sort of supporting the other in a sense. Mm -hmm. But so what, what you're saying about needing to be out there in the street mm. is really, mm. really <laughs> and and obviously the camera with you mm. very often, but not not always. How I, I mean, you moved to Mexico like 1980, 89, 89. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, you stayed there, and one gets the sense that what you encountered there was a a different kind of modernity from yeah. the modernity of Europe. Yeah. And is, has that affected? Totally. The, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> we're very much accustomed to thinking of um, uh, the modernity in Latin America as being this failed modernity. Uh, and, uh, and I think that um, what my work does, in a, in a sense, is in instead of calling these sort of these kind of modernity the, the things that don't work, the thing the chaos, the 
all this stuff that um, apparently is out of sync and, and um, not ordered. Uh, I think my work somehow embraces that. Um, my work, I think, um, embraces those strange encounters that were confined in the street, even on a daily level, and almost going to sort of a more surreal level. Um, but I think what I think was immediately uh, that, that struck me when I went there that, there, that you know, that yes, that all this apparent failure or wrongness was in fact not wrong. It was just something that I was thinking that could be, was, was has been incorporated into my work and is very much a, sort of a, a kind of a potential in the way that that, um, uh, that you know, is, is that I don't think is, 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 is wrong. So I think my work constantly tenses lines between um, modernism, European modernism, and the kind of uh, modernity that I've been experiencing over there. So I think there's always these sort of tensions that come historically, they go backwards, it goes forward, it goes from contemporary to, to the past. So there's all those tensions, I think, appear yeah. in the work. Yes, and uh, what's very striking in Mexico City, for you know, um, by comparison with here on the whole, where modernity, I won't say it had succeeded, but it succeeded in suppressing a lot of the kind of local and human and personal aspects mm -hmm. of, of craft and making things. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico, a vast megalopolis, I mean, much bigger roads than here, <laughs> but there's something still, you know, People are still mending things and making things and making do on the street and in little little shops. It's a very very different mm -hmm. kind of. Um, it's a very it's a it's a very different habitat altogether mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in terms of modernity. Do, I mean, do do you find that actually somehow you you like that? Yeah, Rather I mean, that? just in terms of even the presentation of objects, you know, the mm -hmm. way in which um, you could encounter. Um, in Mexico, just that sort of um, streets of one thing, uh, streets of the same object, streets of mattresses, streets of tools, streets of um, mm. plastic goods, uh, or from Hong Kong, or, um, uh, and, and and I think there's a uh, this was immediately struck me that these kind of um, uh, that there's this there's this sort of sense of saturation and then at the same time accumulation. Okay. Yes, there's one, I mean, there's, actually, that's, there's three questions I now want to ask you. The first one is uh, to do with Orange Lush, which is mm. one of the earliest works in, in the show, which you'll see wonderfully displayed against the wall. Now, it, it, there's a sort of notion that orange is somehow the, the kind of s sign of modernity in Mexico. Mm. Is that how you <laughs> thought of it? <laughs> um, yeah, I think of um, when I was, uh, you, you'll see in a few yeah. minutes, it's, it, yes, it's just this sort of almost like a, a sign board, really, which is covered in all these um, orange objects which I collected over a, a year or two, um, which all seem to have some kind of bodily uh, appendage like. Um, Feeling, and they were all orange because I was, I was I was thinking of the way in which signing in Mexico was very much caught your attention. These kind of fluorescent orange uh, signs were always sort of at the corner of your eye. Always had this sort of uh, consumerism. They always had this sort of sort of idea of selling. That was a quite almost subliminal, I think, the way in which orange functioned that at that moment. And, probably even now, but I think that I was thinking much, it was a chemical orange. It was never about thinking about color in a natural sense. I was thinking of color in, in this chemical sense. Pure chemical, pure mm -hmm. acrylic, mm -hmm. sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. All yeah, the objects yeah. are plastic, mm -hmm. and they all come from this kind of chemical world <laughs> in, um, in the center of Mexico City. And um, this, I think the, um, I think of these collections of objects that I was making as, as somehow forming a kind of archaeology of the future. <laughs> you know, where, where uh, these objects collected from the 90s that, you know, in the future will be forming part of our, what we, 
you know, considered to be mm -hmm, um, relics or artifacts. And so, in a sense, I was collecting or making some kind of archaeological um, representation or selection of what might be archaeology of the future. <laughs> so the ruin, as a, as a, as a Mm -hmm. It was the sign of the end, the end of modernity in some yes, way. Yes, in some way, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, I mean, it's very, very striking, the, the last two films, the um, Fordlandia, mm -hmm. which you'll see, and <laughs> A Hilitla. Mm -hmm. You've moved away from the city mm. um, very much into, you know, mm -hmm. sort of classic tropical mm. jungle world. Mm. Um, and somewhere you said that you, you were talking about abstraction in one of the interviews in the Spiral City uh, catalogue. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that you associated abstraction, or you, or you thought it had largely been talked about in terms of um, spirituality and nature. Uh -huh. Whereas I think I've always thought about abstraction in relation to the city and, and grids and the sort of Mondrian type of thing. But I wonder whether what, what you would say about... Um, this shift of interest, it seems to be a sort of shift of interest of yours towards the ruins in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I think that um, it was always there, and I think about it now, and, and those first days of living in Mexico City. I mean, it's a huge change for me to go, you know, I lived, I was brought up by the sea, and then moving to, I think, probably the biggest city in the world. And, and, and I think now I think of all those, um, you know, constructions or accumulations of, of synthetic stuff that I was picking up as, in a way, some kind of reaction to nature. I was never really kind of comfortable with these um, with mm. these forms. So in a sense, I was. I think that they were always some. They they caused some kind of discomfort in me. Even the colour itself was uncomfortable. You know, it's, it's all, all this paintings and all this work that I did were looking, making the, this colour that you could hardly look at. So somehow, when I, I, I did, well, don't think I was so conscious of it at the time. But now I look back on it and I think that, yes, there was always this sort of coming back or, of some kind of reaction, in a sense, to, um, to nature. But I wasn't so conscious of it at the time. Mm -hmm. So um, when... I made the work in um, Hilitla, which um, some of you might be aware of, is this um, uh, surrealist um, uh, garden that Edward James, patron of the arts, <coughs> associated with the Dardais and surrealists. He made this series of sculptural follies in the jungle in Mexico, uh, in, in, in Mexico, about 10 hours from Mexico City. But it still, to me, this, this place, with his idea was that, that nature would reclaim these structures and that these structures would somehow dissolve back into, into the land, into nature. It still seemed to me, in a sense, though, that this, there was this interesting relationship between the <coughs> urban and the extra-urban context. If you go to Hilita, it's very much like seeing a, a very small, strange city, in a, in a sense. Mm. Um, yes, and the, your, the film is, I mean, <coughs> wonderfully evocative. And of course, you also you include a lot of references to other artists and to yeah. minimalism. I mean, yeah. you start, as far as I recall, with a Schwitter's sound poem. Um, yes, the sonata. <laughs> yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. the sonata. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, the references to Smithson and mm -hmm. Matter Clark. Mm -hmm. Dan Flavin. And Dan, Dan Flavin. Yes. Um, yeah. But. It, <coughs> Yes, um, something, there's a, a phrase that kept coming into my head when I was looking at the, um, the both, both the films actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is from someone called Schumacher, some of you might remember Schumacher who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. And what he said was, um, when, when man has finally conquered nature, he'll find he's on the losing side. <coughs> And, and and I kind of I, I feel that Edward James, in a sense, is is part of that. I mean, he, he's sort of thinking in a rather similar way. And the, the I mean, he, Edward James 
it, he began having bought this incredibly beautiful old coffee plantation with a series of pools and waterfalls in it. They wanted to make it into an orchid, a place where mm -hmm. grow orchids, and all the orchids died. Mm -hmm. And so he started making these a sort of fantastic surrealist garden mm -hmm. of concrete and so on. Mm -hmm. But I think also, as you say, he wanted, or he, 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 he imagined that it would eventually decay and be taken over by the jungle. And I think he, you know, he, he was very familiar with a certain kind of surrealist sensibility. Mm -hmm. A very famous surrealist photograph in, my, in the surrealist magazine Minotaur. It's a photograph of a, of a, of a locomotive which has been abandoned in the virgin forest and has gradually been taken over by all the lianas and everything like that. And the title of the essay by Perret is uh, Nature Devours Progress and Surpasses It. And in a way, that's... And I wondered how much of that, that I mean, feeling is... Definitely, uh, now that you say that, I was uh, very much thinking of that in the, in the Fordlandia project. Um, yes. Where... Um, so just quickly explain. Explain what Portlandia. What yes. Portlandia is mm. is um, a um, small sort of settlement in the on the river Tapajos in the middle of the Amazon, uh, where which was the location for the the, the the new film which you you will see tonight, um, and this was a place uh, uh, started by Henry Ford in the 1920s. And it's um, a series of, of buildings, an industrial site made for the production of natural rubber. Um, uh, the idea was to produce huge amounts of rubber from natural sources, from the, the um, rubber trees around the area. Um, and this was a project um, which over 20 years he invested millions and millions of dollars into. Um, and at the end was a, a failure uh, that, for many reasons, <clears throat> the, the project didn't work. But one of the biggest reasons was because the, um, uh, uh, the, the natural, uh, the nat nature itself was providing some kind of resistance. The trees didn't grow because they were planted them in too many straight lines. They were trying to plant them in order instead of use, leaving a sort of chaotic... Um, uh, environment where they thrive under, so they would catch viruses and they would die, and then, and then malaria. He, Ford brought out a hugely uh, uh, American armed force, um, uh, a managerial force at least, down there. So a lot of people died. It, even uh, some people were eaten by animals, uh, eaten by flies or, or mosquitoes, and you know d d died of. Um, Dysentery and such like. Um, so, what struck me here was again one of these uh, sort of dystopic projects in the middle of nowhere, which I seem to have a kind of magnet to these places. <laughs> um, and I think that what's what I was really interested in there was like a little bit like what you were saying is of how nature is almost like you say, sort of stronger than progress in the sense that nature provides this, this huge resistance to progress and, and modernity. That all that's left there now is a, a series of buildings and a kind of ruin, really. Um, and kind of which side is, 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 the, is, the, is the human being on? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Age or progress. Yes. I always wonders about that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In, in, in the... Um, in the exhibition, you've got three films, I think, and then a room with wonderful cases and objects uh -huh. in. And I th could you say a little bit about uh -huh. how you've arranged them? Because the juxtaposition of things in them is very s sort of striking, and exciting, and unexpected. Yeah, um, I think it's 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 quite strange. I think that the. Um, the idea of it, that they, they're sort of cased in vitrines that look almost Victorian, but they're not Victorian, so they have a, a kind of ambiguity of them uh, in, in, in themselves, in their own right. Um, and then I think there's a, an ambiguity about the objects that are placed within them. Um, 
as you'll see, uh, the idea that um, Anthony and, and I worked on in the show was to provide some kind of a, a walkway through these vitrines. So you'll be taken through, I hesitate to say too much because you probably have, not, you have their own experience, but there's, there's a sort of a synthetic plastic culture and then in, in another vitrine there's a sort of industrial architectural world and then in, in, the, in the vitrine at the back you go through to the to the, um, the sort of natural world, but within each case, there's always anomalies. So you might get a bit of plastic next to an old postcard, and this is very much a sort of an intention within my work in general, where there's this sort of um, dialectical push or pull, where things get stretched <laughs> in time. Um, and uh, in, in terms of narratives, I think I'm thinking of, you know, how um, uh, a bit of <laughs> plastic. In a sense, what I'm asking the viewer to do is, is think about the gap between a piece of plastic and an old postcard. <laughs> mm. um, and and I'm thinking of history in that way instead of this sort of <coughs> lineal narrative sense. I'm I'm jumping around and and trying to tense or stretch those limits mm. of, of, of his, different histories that come together. Mm. Because the way that, that their appearance, it does immediately make you think of, as you say, sort of Victorian natural history yeah. Um, yeah. cabinets where yeah. things are nicely arranged according yeah. to a particular category, like yeah. all the birds' beaks together or whatever yes. it might be. But and you're not wrong. doing it. It's all wrong. Everything's <laughs> wrong. Because it's, it's quite, I would say, it's, it's very... I find it very, it was very exciting. It's, it's, um, it's disorienting. Mm. It's, 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 mm. it's kind of interfering with the categories, but also mm. making you aware mm. that there are any number of ways in which you can arrange things. You know, they can be like that or like, you know, exactly. different, different reasons for putting certain things together. Yes, mm. and, you know, it's, it, it, if you look at it from a distance, you think that there is a certain, like you say, categorization and order. You look closely and really messing with that order. And I think the same thing comes across in the film work as, as well, the deliberate strategies of sound um, interference where uh, you might hear, see an image and hear something completely unrelated to that, to, um, uh, to the image that you're seeing. Sometimes there's very sort of dirty off sounds which um, might look as if they, they should be sort of, they've been wiped off the post-production but they come in and um, so I think that um, I'm playing with all these, in a sense, kind of collages in a, in a way of how, how um, like you say, I think a good word is sort of interfering with many different styles, mm. heterogeneous styles mm. or that, that come together. And in the films as well, because as you say, that. Yeah. The the sound. I mean, it's quite it's quite stark things. Quite like. it's, it's, it's like that. I mean, the, obviously, you know, when we are walking down the street, you hear odd things that don't relate to what you're actually looking at. So it's so it's partly that sort of that is the simultaneity of experience. But but you're kind of going further than that. You're really stretching, mm. really stretching things. I think more. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly striking in Fordlandia, which is fantastic. And, but there's a much much greater use, very different filming in it, from Hilitler and from Spiral City, mm. uh, a much more use of, of close-up yeah. and the contrast between, you know, seeing something in tremendous sort of physical detail, but not quite knowing where it fits within the wider picture, and then suddenly seeing a, yes. this gigantic panorama. Yeah, well, I think that's, that, that's quite a, a kind of feature that's more happening in the in the later works. Mm. But somebody said to me the other day that they think they they felt that in a way I was. Uh, I, I'm not trying to describe any of these places. Uh, I think that's very important to sort of understand about when looking at the films. Is that they're not about description. It's about intensity of the place, or a certain intensity, or a certain pulse of the place. I, I'm, I'm very. I'm interested in thinking about what those sites might mean to us today. So it's, not, it's certainly not about, I was very aware of going to 
not going to Fordland, you're not trying to do a sort of natural geographic description of, uh, of animals or nature of the place. So I'm always looking for a very, you know, framing is really so important in that sense where you're, I'm looking for intensity and not looking for um, description. So there's a, there's a sort of, almost in Fordlandia, I think there's a sort of the non-trip <laughs> There's a sensation that you don't really know where you're going at all, but you're being led into a, a, a certain place. Well, that's exactly, yes. Yes, it, it's not, you know, you're not marking the, the journey. The little begins almost like a kind of diary, doesn't it? it? It's a particular day, and you're going there and doing a particular job. This is completely different, because although there's clearly a journey in it, it's not, that's not the point. <laughs> Nor is it the point to make a sort of National Geographic film of what are actually astonishing animals, I have to say. <laughs> even, even so, no, they're absolutely amazing. But it's the, but the intensity is, I mean, the framing, that, that, you put it so well, because it's often a framing that allows you to have this, I mean, extraordinarily abstract, very beautiful um, shapes and colors. And the intensity of the colors is, is also astonishing. Um, yes. Uh, how much editing went into it? I mean, mm, I, I mean, it's uh, quite a lot. Quite I think lot. I, mm. I, I always edit myself. Uh, I mean, I do work at, with an, an operator, but I, all, I, I can't imagine that anybody else would be able to do this, these things. Um, so it's very much about sort of cutting or splicing at the wrong place, <laughs> just where you think it shouldn't be cut. It's where I'm, quite a lot of the time is where I want to cut, or where it, it's interrupted, or. Um, and I think there's, um, uh, again, the way in which I'm conceiving image and sound, it, it, it was just really, really hard for anybody else to yes. do it. I think that's really where a lot of the work comes in. When I try to, when I'm on these projects, I, I have a kind of clear idea of what I want to be filmed, but there's never, I never go around with a script and I never, work with a, I have a sort of lay, layout of things that I want to achieve and things that I want to film. But I think, you know, the, the real narrative comes about in, in, in editing. Because mm -hmm. the, the intensity you're talking about, I mean, you know, it's almost like experience as, a, as an assault, by the way, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's very, yeah. very strong and yeah. not what you expect. And uh, as you say... It's, it's hard break. for me to know because I'm oh, the one that did it. I did it, it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. This is perhaps the first. This is the first time you've you've seen work over such a long mm. period together. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just ask you about that. What mm. it, you know, how it's been. Um, <laughs> um, well, it. I think that we're um, um, when, when Anthony and I were working on the show, we were feeling that the work this this show should almost feel like a journey uh, in the journey. Like Fordlandia and Hilitlo mm. might be journeys or endeavors uh, that might have gone wrong or endeavors that didn't necessarily work out. Um, so we were quite um, aware that the works that we were choosing for the show would be um, works which um, were, were centered or started in, 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 in one place and then and then grew out along mm. along along this line. Mm. So I think there's yeah we're constantly going back between the urban world and the and the natural world and and perhaps the archaeological world yeah. somehow and, and and how that has folded over the years into this it's surreal in, in a sense, but I don't know if surreal is necessarily the right word. Well, I would, I would like to think it is, actually, for me. For me it, eh? for, yes, for yeah. me, it, it works very very well. But of course, it's not, the, it's not the kind of language in which most people have written about your work, really. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's very frequently referred to. Um, people say well, something surrealist about this. And of course, Hilitler is, is, is very much, you know, was, was made very much... Um, in relation to a particular kind of surrealist yeah. notion of yes. of nature and the world and experience. Yes. I mean, so and I, I think we were also thinking, sorry, just to interrupt, mm. but the, thinking of, of, of how there's these sort of different parallels between uh, 
you know, the fruits of the forest, if you like, or the animals and the fruits of the forest and the, and the fruits and the animals of the, ur- of the urban context. Yes. So I think there's, you know, a play between those two yes. things throughout the show. That, um, I mean, it could be that... I was thinking, I'm, I'm very, very glad you've included the wonderful spiral city film and some of the paintings related to it, which is a kind of wonderful inversion mm-hmm. of Smithson's spiral jetty as you mm-hmm. kind of disappear up. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic film. Mm-hmm. Um, but but from, from that, I feel that, in, in a way, recognizing the disjunctions and the, um, I, I don't know, the, the, the reality is sort of beyond what you're just looking at and juxtapositions is leading you more towards what I call surrealist. Mm. Um, I, I won't, I won't I, press that. Yeah. But, uh, I'm kind of interested in where minimalism meets surrealism. Yes. And yeah. I don't know if I've sorted out this, that answer or if there is an answer. But <laughs> I, I, I think it's a pretty kind of rich terrain to be moving, <laughs> moving into, actually. Probably a good place doesn't... to leave stuff yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How did you happen to in Mexico City as opposed to any other part of the world? Um, yeah, I, I, I was coming out of um, Reading University in 80, 88. Mm-hmm. And there were a group of um, people from Winchester Art College um, who uh, were planning a trip to Mexico City. Well, actually, not, not to, the idea was to not be in Mexico City, but to Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I kind of just tagged along. I, I, I didn't really have a specific interest in um, in Mexico, uh, but I was um, kind of aware that it was a bad <coughs> moment to be producing art in uh, in England. It was a very difficult moment uh, in England at the time, and it was, I think it was a choose, d- choice to to be able to work. You know, to really just be able to focus on our on our own work. Mm. And it was actually an exciting moment in Mexico City, wasn't it, really? Yeah, it started, yeah, it extraordinary it beginning of a, of a, you know, um, very li- lively kind of um, yeah, productive art, art, yeah. art world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about Mel's Kitchen? <laughs> um, well, yes, Mel's Cafe was um, a, uh, a kind of a Sunday activity that I used to do um, with um, with Francis Alice um, in my studio on um, uh, yeah every Sunday <laughs> it was a sort of pop up I think that word didn't even I don't, don't even think exist, didn't pop-up. exist in those it, days it was a kind no. of pop up yeah. k- k- kitchen in uh, in my studio um, so and it I used to keep all the it was a really small studio. And I used to keep all the chairs and tables in the bathrooms. It was a nightmare to get in the bathroom in the, in the, during the week. But I'd keep them all during the week in, my, in the bathroom and get everything out at the weekend. And um, This was kind of really how uh, Francis and I made money at the beginning. We used you to didn't sell them. We, no, we didn't, didn't sell anything. anything. We just lived from week mm. to week on this mm. um, Mel's Cafe. But I think it was a kind of a centre in a sense where... Quite a few people used to turn up, and it was um, sort of a lot of dancing and, um, and cards playing and eating, and um, you know, just kind of being together. But I think it was um, it was a sort of centre for a while, at least, of a you know reunion for many people who mm. might have felt dislodged in some way. Or I don't know. Bulto is a is a piece which I made in Lima in, in 2010, Rafael Ortega. Um, and it's a pink package or blob, uh, very much based on the idea of the um, Fardo Funerarios, which are the um, are traditionally in Inca culture. They were the, um, uh, the Fardo Funerarios are the cloths which. Um, the dead were wrapped in and then subsequently buried in. So the bulto was a sort of modern day pink fardo funerario because it's this plastic uh, unknown quantity or unknown thing and nobody knows what it is or what's inside it. 
and the Bulto travels around um, everywhere in, um, in, in Lima through traffic, through archaeological sites, through um, schools, through collectors' houses, through many places. And it's passed, it's shifted from hand to hand. Nobody knows what this thing is, but nobody wants it, and nobody wants to stay with it. Um, so it's a kind of um, uh, a sort of unknown quantity, or an, in a certain way, a kind of uh, phantasma, which, um, uh, which, as I say, gets circulated. It, there's two. There's a one one long film, and in here we have fragments of the film, which you will travel through the space with. Um, you will sort of travel with Walter somehow. So I don't know if I want to say too much more so that you have your own. <laughs> there are two, it's in two different vitrines, isn't it? The two little films. There's Walter. Oh, four. Four, four, four. four. sorry, Walters four, Walters. four Walters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like a reverse piñata. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't break it. <laughs> So it's this sort of fleshy uh, body. It, it's it's wrapped up like a mum, like a like one of the sort of mummies that were found in mm -hmm. southern mm -hmm. Peru, isn't yes. it? And, yes. and I think it's it's always this thing which sort of is sort of bordering over. Very much, I think this is another sort of just not to go too much detail into it, but it's this sort of this again talking about these kind of modernities that spill over. It's 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 this. This, this informal kind of thing that is, is constantly getting in the way and intruding and blocking and, uh, and circulating. But, um, but that seems to me, a, I mean, it, it's, it's a more striking response to a kind of pre-Columbian past to oh, the, yes. of an ancient civilization than, than anything you've really done in Mexico. Hmm. I mean, that doesn't seem to have been... Um, is yes that, and no. Is that fair? No. Because uh, I think that yeah. you know, Spiral City, uh, in a sense, goes back to that. You know, it's a very layered. Uh, mm. You know, it's a sort of a film that I would say, in a sense, goes back. I'm thinking about those kind of crystalline substructures of mm -hmm. erosion in, in, the, in the very kind of substrata of the city, in a way. Yeah. You know. Yes. Mm. Um, mm. Um, uh, yes, I would agree. It's something that's it's happening more and more. The work, in a sense, is going further and further and digging deeper and deeper. Mm. Um, yes, I, I would say that. Mm. Um, the, sort of, as it were, the archaeology of the future is uh -huh. beginning to meet the archaeology of the, yes. of the past. Yes, very so much so. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any more? Mm. Oh, um, <laughs> well, I'm working on a piece um, uh, in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. Huh? Um, uh, in uh, it's um, another one of these far off places. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's this. The site is called uh, Marielena, and it's the last working salt mine in the world. Um, and the engineering was invented by the Guggenheim family. And it's really fascinating because there's, there's, there's many, if you see Mariolina from above, it's one of these utopian cities in the middle of the desert where, again, they had a sort of exchange of, there was no monetary system there. It was a, a kind of based on a token system um, for the workers and, 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 and the factory itself. So it's... Uh, Amazing, I think, a set of circumstances which again have attracted me to the place, and I think there's this sort of sense of very much sense of material, uh, maybe some kind of a sister or brother project to Fordlandia, where Fordlandia is so much about lusciousness and greenness, and this is about the aridness and uh, you know adversity and so. Mm. so 
Have you started working on that? Uh, just done a, a pilot project, and that's mm. over. Hopefully, this year. Mm. Mm.